Hi everyone, my name is John. Welcome back to my channel. Since I will be coming to you in the next couple of weeks, couple of months actually, with a lot of book reviews, which I know aren't for everyone. They don't bring a lot of traffic. They don't get a lot of views. And that's totally fine. They're, they're mostly for me as a record of my own reading in the past anyway. But I'm glad if they help anyone or if anyone gets anything from them. But I thought intermittently to sort of break up that monotony, I would show you some new books. And what better time to show you a second batch of Princeton University books that I bought all the way back in February when they had a they had a 75% off sale with a good chunk of their backlog on on sale. So I bought too many books, <laughs> uh, 36 I think if I'm not mistaken. And what I'm doing is I'm breaking it up into three sections. I've already filmed the first one. This will be number two, and hopefully after this I will film number three and I will uh, sort of intersperse those with uh, reviews, like I said. So let me get into some more stuff that I got back in February. Okay, first one. I was actually supposed to read this for uh, for the spring, for quarter two of the Storathon, even though technically I guess it's not history. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a poem, of all things, a medieval poem, but a beautiful edition, and for 75% off, uh, $5. It's, it's kind of hard to pass up a new, beautiful book like this uh, with a name that I recognize as a translator. This is The Owl and the Nightingale, and uh, as usual, some of the books that I buy from Princeton University Press I don't know too much about, other than the subject interests me, so... I sort of depend on the ad matter on their website to describe them and talk about them, so I'll do that here too. The Owl and the Nightingale, one of the earliest literary works of the Middle Ages, is a lively and anonymous comic poem about two birds who embark on a war of words in a wood. I say that five times fast. With a nearby, with a nearby poet reporting their argument in rhyming couplets line by line, and blow by blow. In this engaging and energetic verse translation, Simon Armitage captures the verve and humor of this dramatic tale with all the cut and thrust of the original. Uh, it turns out that Vin did end up reading this, and uh, he says that it just kind of presents you with a very, very short introduction, and then it is very short, <laughs> four or five pages and then the poem. So you don't get, unfortunately, a lot of literary or social or historical context for what's going on here. Uh, so you might have to do some internet research to be able to fully appreciate it, but it looks fascinating nonetheless. Next up, I found three books, which are kind of of a, of a feather, uh, and they're all by a fascinating guy. Uh, theologian, philosopher of the 20th century. I'll go by them one by one, uh, but they all have a sort of uh, similar presentations. These are all by Martin Buber, the, the great 20th century Jewish philosopher and theologian. Uh, the first one is Eclipse of God, Studies in the Relation Between Religion and Philosophy, with an introduction by Leora Betninsky. I love these. <laughs> they're, they're so like, well done. I love the typeset. Uh, everything. Biblical in origin, the expression eclipse of God refers to the Jewish concept of okay, some Hebrew that I'm not, that I'm sure I'm going to not do well. Hester Panim H-E-S-T-E-R-P-A-N-I-M. And that is apparently the, the Hebrew term for the act of God concealing his face as a way of punishing his disobedient subjects. So, related to the theory of divine hiddenness. 
Uh, though this idea is deeply troubling for many people, in this book Martin Buber uses the expression hopefully, for a hiding god is also a god who can be found. First published in 1952, Eclipse of God is a collection of nine essays concerning the relationship between religion and philosophy. The book features Buber's critique of the thematically interconnected yet diverse perspectives of Soren Kierkegaard, Hermann Cohen, Carl Jung, Martin Heidegger, and other prominent thinkers. Buber deconstructs their philosophical conceptions of God and explains why religion needs philosophy to interpret what is authentic and spiritual encounters. He elucidates the religious implications of the I-Thou relationship. Uh, Buber, if you, if you know his name, you probably know him for a book called I and Thou, which talks about uh, a person's subjective relationship with another person, another subject. It's basically a, a, a book-long essay about a dialogical relationship and explains how the exclusive focus on scientific knowledge in the modern world blocks the possibility of a personal relationship with God. Uh, as a thoroughly secular person, uh, Martin Buber has always uh, nevertheless interested me. So, Eclipse of God by Martin Buber. Essays. Uh, two more books by Martin Buber. This is uh, Hasidism and or Hasidism and Modern Man by Martin Buber. Does this have a subtitle? No. Uh, Hasidism, a controversial mystical religious movement of Eastern European origin, has posed a serious challenge to mainstream Judaism from its earliest beginnings to the middle of the 18th century. Decimated by the Holocaust, it has risen like a phoenix from the ashes and has constituted itself as a major force in the world of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Philosopher Martin Buber found inspiration in its original tenets and devoted much of his career to making its insights known to a wider readership. First published in 1958, Hasidism and Modern Man examines the life and religious experiences of Hasidic Jews, as well as Buber's personal response to them. From the autobiographical, I guess this is another collection of essays, from the autobiographical My Way to Hasidism to Hasidism and Modern Man and Love of God and Love of Neighbor, the essays span nearly half a century and reflect the evolution of Buber's religious philosophy in relation to the Hasidic movement. Hasidism and Modern Man remains prescient in its portrayal of a spiritual movement that brings God down to earth and speaks and makes possible a relationship in which the human being becomes sacred. And one more. Um, this is, is this, are these also essays? They might be interrelated, or they might be just a, I don't know. I'll have to dive into it when I see. Uh, this was published in 1949. Uh, this is The Prophetic Faith by Martin Buber. Features uh, Buber's readings of select biblical prophets, especially Isaiah and Deborah, uh, Deborah being the only female prophet and judge in the Hebrew Bible. In, uh, in an approach that combines insights from biblical prophecy with a concern for events in the here and now, Buber outlines his interpretation of biblical revelation uh, infused with an anti-institutional and some would even say anarchic sensibility. Buber discusses the notion of kingship as portrayed in the Bible and provides an account of human suffering in an extended discussion on the book of Job anticipating those today who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious, Buber gives pride of place to a personal God outside of formal religions and legal structures. So moving on from Martin Buber uh, to some ancient history. This is... Uh, Jared Diamond beats ancient Rome, I guess. Uh, 
This is The Fate of Rome by Kyle Harper, Climate, Disease, and the End of an Empire. Here is the monumental retelling of, I love this ad matter sometimes, a monumental retelling of one of the most consequential chapters of human history, the fall of the Roman Empire. The Fate of Rome is the first book to examine the catastrophic role that climate change and infectious diseases played in the collapse of Rome's power, a story of nature's triumph over human ambition. Interweaving a grand historical narrative with cutting-edge climate science and genetic discoveries, Kyle Harper traces how the fate of Rome was decided not just by emperors, soldiers, and barbarians, but also by volcanic eruptions, solar cycles, climate instability, and devastating viruses and bacteria. The Fate of Rome is a sweeping account of how one, how one of history's greatest civilizations encountered and endured, yet ultimately succumbed to, the cumulative burden of nature's violence. If you watch my channel, you've seen me talk several times about this imprint. They used to be associated with Princeton. They used to not be associated with Princeton University Press, but now you can find all of their books there. Um, I guess they're just a subsidiary of it, or they distribute it. I don't know what the relationship is, but I'm glad it exists because they're a really, really fascinating publisher. Their name is Zone Books. All of their books have this kind of presentation. Title, uh, usually a line, author's name, uh, Zone Books on the cover. <clears throat> and the covers are pretty distinctive too. Many of them are works in translation. Not all, but many. Uh, this is a, a book called Society Against the State. Uh, by a guy whose name I always see in, not always, have often seen in print, but uh, don't really know how to pronounce, I guess, Pierre Clastres, or Pierre Clastre, I, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a, a book I've seen pop up every once in a while in the field of sort of historical anthropology, theoretical anthropology. In this seminal founding work of I guess this is calling it political anthropology, which is also appropriate. Um, the author takes on, so let's just call him the author instead of saying his name, takes on some of the most abiding and essential questions of human civilization. What is power? What is society? How, among all possible modes of political organization, did we come to choose the monolithic state model and its accompanying regimes of coercion? As he shows, other and different regimes do indeed exist, and they existed long before ours. Regimes in which power, though it manifests itself everywhere, is nonetheless non-coercive. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm... I, anthropology is uh, something I, I wish I knew uh, a lot more about, and I've, I've read some about in passing, but I didn't have this and had always heard about it. Let's see. I think this is my last zone book uh, for, for this installment, at least. This is by an anthropologist who died a few years ago, but did some fascinating work in the 60s, 70s, 80s. His name is Marshall Salins, and uh, Princeton has a, a few things by him, but uh, I got this called Culture and Practice Selected Essays, also by Zone, as you can see. Um, and this is quite quite big. It's, it's a selection of his essays over a, a wide period of time. So this collects both the seminal and the more obscure academic and political writings of the anthropologist Marshall Salins from the 60s through the 90s. Uh, more than a compilation, this book unfolds as an intellectual autobiography. Salins's reportage and reflections on the anti-war movement 
in the mid-60s marked the intellectual development from early general studies of culture, economy, and human nature to the more historical and globally aware works on indigenous peoples, especially uh, Pacific Islanders. So, more anthropology. Moving to uh, 18th century London. <laughs> this is a Dinner with Joseph Johnson. Books and Friendship in a Revolutionary Age by Daisy Hay. Uh, once a week, in late 18th century London, writers of contrasting politics and personalities gathered around a dining table. The veal and boiled vegetables may have been unappetizing, but the company was convivial and the conversation brilliant and unpredictable. The host was Joseph Johnson, publisher and bookseller, a man at the heart of literary life. In this book, Daisy Hay paints a remarkable portrait of a revolutionary age through the connected stories of the men and women who wrote it into being and whose ideas still influence us today. So, uh, yeah, literary history, it's, it's a weakness. I just have to, I have to go for it. And uh, sometimes when you go through the dregs of a Princeton University book sale, you know, they'll put a thousand, two thousand, four thousand books on sale, and of course that means I have to spend my entire afternoon and evening uh, looking at every single title and seeing what I'm interested in. So apparently this is a classic kind of autobiography slash intellectual portrait of a fascinating person whose name you'll recognize. Um, his name is Clauswitz, von Clauswitz. Clauswitz in the state. Uh, the Man, His Theories and His Times by Peter Parrott. This originally came out nearly half a century ago in 1976. Clauswitz in the state presents a comprehensive analysis excuse me, of one of the significant thinkers of modern Europe. Peter Parrott combines social and military history and psychological interpretation with a study of Clausewitz's military theories and his unduly neglected historical and political writing. So if you, if you know Clausewitz, he wrote a book called On War, which has been translated several times. You can find versions of it uh, in several, you know, like Wordsworth classics and probably Penguin classics. Um, but uh, this was interesting. I, I don't think I've ever read a standalone study of, of Clausewitz or his ideas. So I jumped at that. Three more. I picked this up. This is Vanguard of the Revolution by yeah, A. James McAdams, who is uh, at the University of Notre Dame. And this is uh, his Vanguard of the Revolution, the global idea of the Communist Party. Vanguard of the Revolution is a sweeping history of one of the most significant political institutions of the modern world. The Communist Party was a revolutionary idea long before its supporters came to power. A. James McAdams argues that the rise and fall of communism can be understood only by taking into account the origins and evolution of this compelling idea. He shows how the leaders of parties and countries as diverse as the Soviet Union, China, Germany, Yugoslavia, Cuba, and North Korea adapted the original ideas of revolutionaries like Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin to profoundly different social and cultural settings. Vanguard of the Revolution is essential reading for anyone seeking to understand world communism and the captaining, captivating idea that gave it life. So, uh, stuff about 
Marxism, socialism, communism with a historical bent, kind of like in the vein of To the Finland Station by Edmund Wilson. Uh, very interesting. Oh, I lied. There was one more dog book. Yeah. <laughs> Last one, I promise, this time. This is a book about late 19th century Paris by Siegfried Krakauer, whose name you might know if you're a film history buff. Uh, he's a, a film theorist, a, a media theorist, early part of the 20th century. And he wrote that book called... Oh, I'm going to be so embarrassed if I misquote it. It's something like Hitler and Caligari. Oh. Oh, goodness. I should have looked this up before I turned the camera on, but I didn't. And he wrote a book called Jacques Offenbach and the Paris of His Time by Siegfried Krakauer. Jacques Offenbach, if, you, if you're not familiar with his name, he was a composer. He wrote... Um, mostly sort of light operetta type music at, you know, d during the late 19th century. His, his most famous pieces being an operetta called uh, The Tales of Hoffman, based off of the, uh, the, some of the works of E.T.A. Hoffman. Siegfried Krakauer's Jacques Offenbach and the Paris of His Time brill brilliantly reconfigures the biography form the biography form, into a remarkable work of social and cultural history. In a book that has frequently been compared to uh, Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project, uh, Krakauer uses the life and work of Offenbach to assemble a penetrating portrayal of Second Empire Paris. So now, jump forward... 120 or 140 years, and um, halfway across the world. <clears throat> this is The Party and the People, Chinese Politics in the 21st Century by Bruce J. Dixon. Since 1949, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has maintained unrivaled control over the country, persisting even in the face of economic calamity, widespread social upheaval, and the violence against its own people. Yet the party does not sustain dominance through repressive tactics alone. It pairs this with surprising responsiveness to the public. The party and the people explores how this paradox helped the CCP endure for decades, and how this balance has shifted increasingly toward repression under the rule of President Xi Jinping. So, that wraps up my second group of books, second installment of books. I uh, hope you saw something you liked. If you've seen anything you liked or have read or are interested in or want to hear me talk about, let me know in the comments. I love hearing from everyone. And I will see you next time. Bye.